Okay, so we're talking about public speaking. Who needs this? Short answer? Yeah, raise your hand, just about everybody. This goes for faculty members, this goes for students, administrators, music management types, performers, running the gamut. Even those who are usually content in letting their playing do the talking for them, or people like faculty members who might say, what's the big deal? I stand up in front of my classroom every day. I'm used to that. There are going to be likely, they're gonna be likely to encounter some instances where they're not gonna be as comfortable, where it's not going to seem as familiar. Say if a performer is, you still hear me? Say if a performer is having to do a community engagement session here at CMS, they're gonna to need to come out of their shell to do that. Say if a faculty member is charged with leading a faculty, faculty meeting, something they're gonna to have to feel confident in doing. Say you're going in front of a board or a faculty committee to ask for money. Never comfortable, but you need to be able to state your case clearly and effectively in order to get that funding. So actually, this is relevant to quite a large majority of us, of course. I'm gonna start with the basics of just how to construct a good speech. The thing that I'd like to underline the most, and you probably already know this, is organization. How many of us have heard talks or presentations or sermons or whatever where the person kind of got from point A to point B, but my golly, they took a lot of detours along the way? That makes it really hard as an audience member to grasp what the speaker's talking about and to take anything away from it. So that organization part is a crucial, crucial, crucial part of it. Now, I start out, even in the computer age, very simply with a blank piece of paper and a pen. And I just jot down anything that comes to my brain, kind of like Michael's list that he was showing us. It can be stupid, it can be profound, anything that pops into the head goes down on the list. Then I do the same thing for that topic, adding to the list, perhaps a couple days later, where my subconscious has had the chance to kick in a little bit and I've molded over some more. And maybe one more session after that. That's gonna give me a lot of information to at least jumpstart what it is I wanna talk about. Second of all, I look through the list and I'm able to see, okay, this is an area I'd like to pursue some more. I'm gonna to need to further research this. So I work to kind of fill in the gaps that I notice in my initial list. At that point, I go to the outline stage. This is where I have to get really, really organized or it's not going to work. I see where the natural groupings are within my notes and start to piece that together, hopefully in some sort of logical, cohesive effort. Now, while I'm doing this, there are a lot of ideas that are just being purged, basically. You can't include everything. Your audience will not grasp it. You will end up speaking for two and a half hours, which your audience will not appreciate. So at this stage, you're really having to make sure that you're picking out the best, most relevant ideas and putting aside the rest for perhaps another time. Dale Carnegie wrote that his idea was to assemble 100 concepts and then to discard 90 of these. That might, you might think that's a little bit extreme, but I think the point is well taken on that. Once my outline is established, further research. I can now see even more clearly where I don't have a quote that's gonna work, where I need to fill in an example to make sure that all this is gonna happen. And then finally, I continue to reorganize. I usually go through two or three or even four versions of my outline until I finally come up with something that looks like this that nobody on earth except myself would understand. That's okay, you don't have to see it, it's not being published. But at this stage, um, I'm able to really see what works, what's too verbose, what needs fleshing in, and I figure this out as I practice, and I practice and I practice, and I run through things enough times so I can see how it flows. This practice, of course, is necessary for clarity, it's necessary for your own comfort, and frankly, it's necessary so that you don't go too long. One of the first regional conferences that I attended, we were all allotted 25 minutes for our talks, and this one gentleman got up and he proceeded to talk for 45 minutes. Bless his heart. No questions, no feedback from the audience, he just talked. And I guarantee you that once he hit maybe minute 31, 32, something like that, 
nobody was really paying attention to the content of what he was talking about. They were looking at their watches, they were kind of clearing their throats, they were thinking, I wish he would stop so we won't run really behind. So you need to make sure that you're falling within the parameters that you've been given. In terms of content, of course it will vary depending on your topic, but I think that there are several things to keep in mind. First of all, gear it towards the correct audience. If I were to get up here and talk about public speaking as if I were training a first grader how to embark on his or her first show and tell, it wouldn't work. I wouldn't be effective, you would be offended, and it just wouldn't be helpful to anybody. So know your audience and gear it towards your audience. This is not the place for your own kind of personal catharsis. This is, you know, for your listeners. Secondly, it's good to include examples, anecdotes from your life, from the lives of others. People retain those sorts of fun facts in there. Probably when you see me two days from now, you might remember that I'm the one who talked about the dude who talked for 20 minutes too long at the regional, right? But you, again, want to kind of use this with discretion. You're not interested in my entire personal history, and I don't blame you. I could stand up here and say, okay, these are my speaking experiences in my life, the trials and the triumphs and my 10th grade. Who cares? I'm not interested, you wouldn't be either. So keep them to a minimum, keep them relevant to the discussion at hand. On the other hand, your presentation does need to reflect you, what you think of this subject, your viewpoint, your opinion, some of your experiences there. Otherwise, audiences tend to be less engaged. If you're just giving them a list of facts, oh, here's a fact from this book, here's one from this website, they can do that themselves. They can Google the topic and they'll end up with it. So, you know, keep it within the confines of what's going to be helpful, again, to your audience. Now, in order to present a speech well, see how much I can tell you in five minutes, there's not a whole lot, but there's certain basics that everybody talks about. The fact that you want to have some sort of eye contact going on, the fact that you don't want to just read hunched over like that, I'm not even sure I could do that with my 41-year-old eyes, but you want to make sure that you're really almost having a conversation with your audience. You want to make sure that you're not talking too fast, which is something that I tend to do a lot. Um, but in many cases, the success or the ultimate failure of a speech comes down to whether or not you're able to effectively combat the fear factor. This is a very real deal to a lot of people, which is why I started out with my slight chicken hood. You know, it was conventional wisdom to me that public speaking ranked really high on lists of adult fears, but I'd never really seen the proof. So what do we do? We go to Google. And so I Googled a bunch of lists of adult fears. What do you know? It's true. One of the lists had fear of public speaking at number one, and what was it above? It, it beat out heights, fear of flying, and fear of death. Okay, great, you'd rather die than speak. One of the, another one had it at number one again, this time above lots of things that give you the willies, confined spaces and snakes and spiders. And then on another one, it fell down to number three, but it still beat out fear of financial collapse, fear of failing health, and fear of death. There are a lot of scared people out there, which is for which this is a kind of a formidable task. So, how do you get beyond this? You know, how do you get beyond kind of the mental and the physical and the emotional impact of just being nervous or being petrified? S for some people, it's so extreme that they just avoid it altogether. If there's a position that they know might include some public speaking engagements, they're just going to avoid it. Students who avoid it in classes. So certainly there must be a way to get beyond this. And the good news is there are many techniques to help you with this. Fears can be quelled to a large extent. I'm going to give you some basic advice and then show you some sources that can go a lot deeper into it. First of all, to be more at ease, you have to be securely prepared. You have to have done your research, you have to have done your organization, and gone through it a couple of times. So when you get up in front of the audience, you know, you're going to feel a little bit different, but it's still going to have that air of familiarity, which is going to make you feel more confident. You can expand this to use a technique that's used a lot in sports psychology, in combating performance anxiety and that sort of thing. And that's mental practice or mental rehearsal. 
take a moment, please, and just think of an upcoming presentation or talk or speaking engagement you might have coming up. If you don't have one, make it up. Okay? Now shut your eyes. Can you, you shut your eyes? Can you picture the room where you will be doing the speaking? If not, just formulate something that would be comparable. Picture yourself making the talk. Are you sitting or standing in this sort of setting? What are you wearing? Check out the look on your face. Is it calm? Is it confident? Is it open to the audience? If not, make those mental adjustments. Visualize the audience. Picture them looking engaged, responding to what you say by laughing at corny jokes, by nodding, by little smiles. Picture the response at the end whether it be applause, whether it be people coming up to you afterwards with some positive, impact, positive reinforcement there. And go ahead and open your eyes. Don't fall asleep on me now. This is the really, really short version of something that has proven really valuable to people. Because when you go through the mental rehearsal process, the, the sweat glands and the, the um, beating heart, they kind of are almost activated to a certain extent. Plus, it gives you, again, that sense of familiarity once you get in front of the public. This is typically expanded quite a bit, where you would first visualize yourself leading into the talk, then kind of go through the whole, whole process, and then see the successful aftermath. But this has proven very helpful to a lot of people. Finally, it's good to have some sort of pre-performance ritual, something that you do before you talk that makes you feel comfortable and gives you a measure of control. I mean, face it, I can stand up here, I can't control how you react. It would be nice when I see you engaged and you are, but if you all fell asleep on me, there's not a whole lot I could do. But you can control what you do ahead of time. Whether you, you know, routinely get up early and do a good workout, whether you read all of the Sunday paper, if you listen to Beethoven's Ninth, if you watch the Brady Bunch, something that kind of gets you geared up and ready to go is gonna be real positive for you. Finally, it's, this is natural to some extent. You don't want the fears that are going to debilitate you. But on the other hand, butterflies are kinda of normal. I mean, I think a lot of us feel that. And once you kinda of get into the speech, if you're well prepared, they tend to go away. But it's not a good thing if leading up to it, you start to say, oh my gosh, I'm nervous, I'm tense, I'm nervous, I'm tense, I shouldn't be nervous, I shouldn't be tense, and what happens? <laughs> you get more nervous, you get more tense, exactly. So realize what's normal, what's natural for you, let it flow, and know that if you're well prepared, it should flow well once you get up here. We have handed out a list of sources, some of them are golden oldies like the Dale Carnegie books. Some of them are more specifically geared towards kind of combating these fears, not only in public speaking, but in other areas as well. They go a lot more in depth than we're able to go right now into specific exercises, specific drills, and specific techniques that are helpful if this does impact you. And now I'm going to hand things over to Michael, who's going to talk about some specific tools. Thank you, Terry Lynn. I am. Um not much of a chicken in public speaking these days because I've worked on it. What I'm going to do for you in the next few minutes, I'm going to give you one method of learning for public speaking, and I am also going to give you a, a system that, uh, for organizing your speeches, and it's both things are going to be very brief. The first is I'm going to talk about Toastmasters. Has anyone here a member of Toastmasters or done Toastmasters? Very few. Toastmasters is an, a national club that is for public speaking, and it is a place that I have gone, I have learned how to improve my public speaking. And what it does is it gives you a learning strategy for public speaking, it gives you practice at public speaking, it gives you feedback. And to me, going to Toastmasters is better than any public speaking course that I could envision in college. So rather than ha try to have your students go to a public speaking course at your school, you might, and, and that of course would be it's still encouraged, but Toastmasters is a great place to learn how to do it. Uh, what a Toastmasters meeting 
consists of, and, and let me say, with Toastmasters, there are local clubs everywhere. If you go to look at toastmasters.org, but find a club and put your zip code, you'll probably have 10 Toastmasters clubs within driving distance and different schedules for you. And one of the ways that I, well, the way I learned about Toastmasters is I listened to, to an audio book by a man named Harvey McKay, who does uh, books on networking, and, uh, and networking is his thing. So he talked about Toastmasters, said, if you go to Toastmasters for a year and, and you don't get anything out of it, if you pay your dues and go there for a year, don't get anything, you can write me, Harvey McKay, I will give you your money back. I said, wow, I can go and do this and not have to pay anything if I, if I don't like it. So if you go to a Toastmasters meeting, they have a few things. They will usually have a table topics, and that was without any preparation. Someone has prepared some questions, and you will get up and say, okay, here's the question. Come up and, and speak about that for two minutes. And that person will come up and talk about it. All speeches are timed in Toastmasters, so you get used to working with a clock. And so the table topics, there are prepared speeches, and as you get through the different levels of Toastmasters, you will make a series of prepared speeches, and they will guide you in terms of organizing your speech, body language, working with an audience. There are all kinds of ways that they have of walking you through that. And, uh, and you have an evaluation. So when you make a prepared speech, somebody else will be assigned to evaluate you, and they will get up and make a short speech evaluating what you did, give you positive feedback, say what you could work on. And the whole thing is very welcoming. It's we're all in the same boat here. So you get people who are very good speakers already and just looking to get better. You have people whose knees are knocking together. And the first prepared spe the speech in Toastmasters is the icebreaker. So, okay, start out, just come up and tell us who you are for five minutes. And, and, and it's, it, but it's just such a wonderful thing. And I will tell you a benefit for uh, the musicians in, in a minute. Uh, the Benefits of Toastmasters, it's not something that you have to add to the curriculum. It's something that you have an experience with adult learning. And when you're sending your students to something, it's good to get them used to how adult learning works past the, the university. And, and I find it very good with that. It gives you the components of speaking, and it gives you an evaluation of how you're doing. And it's ongoing. It's not just preparing for one big speech in a semester. Every time you go there with table topics, you're called up there to speak. You can speak with a prepared speech as many times as you want. And, um, and the best benefit for me, and it was an unexpected benefit, is that when I started giving prepared speeches at Toastmasters, it enabled me to talk about music to non-musicians. And that is huge. You go, because we all, particularly in universities, we are literally talking to the choir. We're preaching to the choir. Everybody knows who we are, what we do, the value of music. We're all sold on that. And in the course of our days, sometimes we don't see anybody who's not already pre-sold on all of that. So you want to really get a reality check. Go and talk to non-musicians in a Toastmasters meeting about music, and you can see how well things work with, with people. It's invaluable when I'm doing uh, music advocacy in the community. You're talking with community members. You're talking with the car dealer to see how they would want to uh, advertise in your uh, in your program it, it's great experience so uh, I would um, I will make you the very same guarantee that Harvey McKay did if you go to Toastmasters for a year and you pay your dues and you participate if you don't like it write to Harvey McKay and ask for your money back <laughs> so uh, I, so yeah, or write me. I'll give. I'll I'll look him up and, and give you the, the information because uh, he's got more money than I do. <laughs> and by the way, you won't need your money back. So the next thing I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to uh, step away from the mic here. So hopefully, we can. Um, you can hear me. I'm going to talk about the 
Bert Decker Grid. And one of the resources in there is a man named Bert Decker, and he's great at organizing speeches. And his book, which just came out last week in its most recent edition, is You've Got to Be Believed to Be Heard. And, uh, and I'm going to show you a little bit about a quick organization thing that, uh, that he has called the Decker Grid. And I'll lay it out for you. And the benefit is that it allows you to focus on the important things in a speech and really do it quickly. So I'm going to step over to my chart here because I'm very slow at flip charts. What he will have you do, can everybody see this? If not, I'm sorry, I'll speak it. And the cornerstones of a speech, and the first is point of view. And with these cornerstones, it's what you think about when you're first laying out your presentation. And sometimes you don't even have time to get to the body of a speech, so absolutely you'll have to focus on these things. So point of view. What is your point of view when you're talking to people? My point of view is that this is a, a great uh, system of speaking here. The next thing, the action. When you're talking to people, what action do you want them to take? And this, by the way, does work for written presentations too. A cover letter. This is a good system for laying things out. What benefits are the people that you are speaking to? What are they going to receive from that? And while you're thinking about those three things, point of view, action, and benefits, you're also thinking about your listeners, your audience, and you think about what he calls DNA, demographics, needs, and attitudes. So who are they? What do they need? What's their, their various uh, attitudes about things? So these are the cornerstones of what we have in the, in the Burt Decker grid. So we really need to think about those things and in the opening of a presentation you would give those things. Here's my point of view. Here's what I'd like you to do. Here's what you'll benefit from if you do it. And you close the speech the same thing. So the old saw, tell them, <laughs> tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, then tell them what you said so that you really get the whole bit. Now, once you've laid out the cornerstones, you have to assemble the body of the speech. Now, say you are telling someone that you should be the, uh, a new professor. You're looking for a job, and here's why you should hire me. Well, I, the point of view is you should, you know, I think I'd be great for this position. The action, I want you to interview me, bring you to your campus. The benefits, you will just see how super I am. At, at everything here so that you can hire me. And you know who you're talking to with that committee. You've researched that institution and you know who the people are. You've looked at who's on the search committee as best you can determine or at least the person you're speaking to. Now, this is the part I don't have laid out yet because when you're talking about various topics, you say, okay, what is everything I could say? about myself at this institution. And there may be all kinds of things that points you can make that you write down on post-it notes. And here's my education, here's what I did, here's what my dissertation was about, and here's what everything about me. And you can just randomly think about everything you might want to put in there and put it on on post-it notes so that you make sure that you get everything in there. Then you think, okay, now what groupings do we have? How can I cluster these things to be in a few different categories? And if I had more post-its put out here, we could have five or ten things in each of these categories. And the beauty of this is that they're movable. And you're thinking about making clear, concise points and supporting them. So you think about all these various things that you may not have organized. You put them into individual topics. You cluster them. And then you see what the top things are. OK, if I'm making three points, what are the top two or three supporting points 
to each thing. And then, because you've done this, if you need to elaborate more, you will have thought about how you can elaborate more with that. So, with the Decker grid, you start out with your point of view, your action, your benefits. You think about who you're talking to. You organize the body of your presentation using those post-its or you do this enough you start to do it mentally. How can I organize these in just a few things so I'm concise, people can remember just a few things, and what would the subcategories be of that so you can just really have an effective presentation, main body of your presentation, then go back to point of view, action, and benefits. And you know, once again, you know, here's my point of view. Here's what I'd like you to do. Here's what you'll get, you know, as a benefit to you and to your organization. And to me, that is, you know, I learned this years ago. I have it in my head, and this is, how, and, and I like systems that you can have in your head very simply. So, uh, so I would recommend that you uh, get to Bert Decker's book or. Or, or just see about the Decker grid. It really worked. It's something that has worked for me because it's simple and it's easy and, and you really don't leave out the important things. So uh, what I'd like you to do is to learn more about it, practice organizing this, go to Toastmasters and organize one of your speeches this way and you'll have a real good benefit and a good way to tell your students about how to organize their minds along this route too. All right?